Well, Richard, thanks for coming to on my show. You're welcome, Dan. I'm happy uh, to be here. Yeah, so you are on my show because you teach acting, and we're going to talk about acting. Okay. And uh, well, you're also my uncle. Uh, full disclosure. That is true. <laughs> my audience, uh, I'm not at the stage where I can just get any person who's a big wig, but but we're going to have a good conversation. I anyway. guess this is uh, reverse nepotism. Yeah. Well. I, okay. So right. <laughs> So what is it, why don't you uh, say, what's your exact uh, job? What do you do? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, what is my exact job? Um, well, just how about the title? My title, first, all right, first. which may or may not be helpful in you understanding do. my job. Uh, right now, as I have been for the last 15 years, um, I'm the associate director of the drama division at Juilliard. I, um, I've been, at Juilliard as, as a teacher and a, and a director of projects and plays for, uh, gosh, over 33 years. Um, but I also have this other title and, and administrative duties as associate director. And I also, um, kind of amazingly to me, to be honest with you, I also teach um, a scene study class at NYU's graduate acting program, which is really a, also an excellent program. So I'm in two places. Two places. You're teaching a lot of people. Uh, I mean, and these these are supposed to be some some good places, and uh, a lot of good people have come through. There's probably a lot of yeah. Good... I, I have to. I admit, if I'm I'm, I'm feeling both in the some uh, strange negative synergy of inflation and 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 self deprecation, I feel like. Someone's going to look back and say, oh, here's the man who ruined an entire generation of actors. Ruined an entire generation. <laughs> Presumably, there are, there are some great actors out there who, were, uh, who you taught uh, influence, must have, in, in some way, or they're great, I don't know, uh, because of or... Uh, because of me or despite me. Despite right. Of you, right? <laughs> I, I mean, and probably a lot of great actors that people don't know uh, yes. also. Um, so I guess... Uh, I want to. I want to ask you a lot of questions about sure. this. Um, well, how about this? Let's just start. Can anyone act? Um, I no, I don't think so. I think. Yeah, I don't think so either. Uh, it seems like you could, because what you're doing essentially is um, embodying, representing humanness, human behavior, which which is what we're doing all the time. Uh, just naturally we're living and um but then to recreate that takes i think a certain um i don't know what to call it i mean we uh, the shorthand word for that is talent but there's also a craft around it uh, i think a lot of people in the same way that a lot of people can write words doesn't mean that they're writers yeah and we all live and um, and certainly, uh, it's also true that on movies and TVs you see a lot of people who never studied acting, who were athletes or whatever, who are quote unquote acting, makes one feel like a lot of people can be actors. But I think actually actors are very rare and very special members of uh, the Homo sapiens community. Actually. Well, I'm prepared to believe that. I just, I, I want to know if, if there's any more you can say about what it is, what it is that it actually takes. What is it about them? What is it about a person who can act versus a person? I, I, I think who, about, yeah, no, I think about this all the, all, all the time. And I don't know, I, 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 I certainly know I don't have a definitive answer. I can, at this moment we're having this conversation, it does seem to be true that for whatever reason, I don't know if it's an evolutionary advantage or an accident of evolution, that human beings are affected as much or maybe even more by what they imagine as they are by reality itself, quote unquote reality. That imaginary realities can affect our emotionally and even physiologically as much or more as life itself. And why that should have happened to us, why our brains that work, 
work that way and our bodies work that way, I do not know. You mean, but, do you, so just, just to, do you mean uh, a, a fiction that is for an audience or do you mean the, what a person trying to act imagines? I, I mean both, actually. I, I think both of those things are, are what make uh, theater and movies possible, that both the person inside the fiction and the person watching the fiction are moved by what happens and how that should be true or why that should be true. I don't know. I, I think one can begin to think of some potential evolutionary advantages about why um, stories move us and therefore change us as opposed to everybody having to live through everything. Um, one can begin to think about why that might be helpful for a species. Um, but I do feel like that's that's one of the things that's going on. And to answer your question, I feel like there are some people who seem to, for whatever reason, um, have a predilection or a susceptibility to um, be um, moved by imaginary reality. And they can inhabit imaginary realities and live through it and undergo a story right in front of our eyes as if it were happening to them. I think that's what acting is. You know, that's, um, so that, I guess that explains, you say everyone seems to be able to be moved by fiction. Yes. But there are only certain people who can somehow inhabit an imagined reality and, and, and be, as you say, moved by even that. The, yes. The, so as to project that, that thing. Uh, to other people, like a lot of people can absorb it, but maybe uh, very few people can be in it. Uh, is that is that? Yeah, I, no, I, 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 no, no. I think that I, that's my experience. Um, does it mean that there is? It doesn't mean that there isn't a craft to learn, to enhance one's um, powers and one's talents, and that there isn't uh, um, things you can learn uh, that make you stronger at it, better at it, um, and strengthen your instincts and natural talents. I believe in that very strongly. Otherwise, I wouldn't be teaching it. But I, I think there, there is an inherent, um, uh, I keep coming back to the word talent. Maybe that's just a shorthand word, and maybe I need to unpack that. An inherent um, ability in the same way that people have different kind of abilities in terms of math or um, painting or uh, you know, understanding different aspects of reality that there's a, a predilection, and I don't know where that lives, that, that then can be strengthened and enhanced through learning a craft. Because math makes sense to me. You know, you give me the rule and I apply the rule at least as a child, but but uh, the trying to imagine and be moved by something uh, that I somehow, on some level, know and, and other part of my brain is not true. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know who can do that or, or how. I mean, that certainly was. Uh, I, I did a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Of uh, had some experience in the uh, at least acting training world. We uh, we were told this thing: living truthfully in imaginary circumstances. Mm -hmm. the, the yes, and that's a very good. I don't, I, you know, I've heard that phrase um, in many sort of variations around that. And I think that's a really good shorthand to talk about um, what might be going on there. I mean, different, what truthful is, is something that, that I, I think can be, that has changed an idea of what that is or, and what that looks like in different medium, what it looks like in the theater, what it versus what it looks like in TV and movies. But that's not a bad definition of what acting is. Okay, I want to get to that later because there will be some, there's some aspects of acting where you are trying to show something like real behavior and there's some forms of acting that are not real behavior. That's right. But I, I, I guess um, you have to tell, so you say some people can do it, some people can. It's not clear it, maybe what it is to do it, you say you can train mm -hmm. it. You you do both the job of teaching people okay. and also choosing the students that you teach. So, right, yeah. you are already, you don't just take anyone off the street. 
okay. to try to make them an actor. As you, say, you 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 select already for people who are showing you something. Yes. So so what is it that uh, you know? I, okay. So in the beginning, what, so what is it that someone has to has to have? Yeah, I, I have to say I, that process, Dan, of of meeting people that for, will audition at Juilliard. Uh, maybe anywhere from 1,800 to 2,000 people per year who are interested um, in coming to the school um, for 18 places. Sorry, how many did you say? 1,800, let's say, just to make it round, nice, good round numbers for 18. Sorry. So what percentage is that, my, my math nephew? <laughs> <laughs> is that 0.1%? 0.1? Or is it 1%? 1%. 1%. Okay. That's pretty, you know, that's tough. I mean, I, but I will also tell you at the same time that that's an extremely humbling process. Um, and to make those decisions. And I just, uh, I, uh, people always use this term. I, I, I hate it when people say it's this or that was, hum they get an award and then they say they're humbled. Well, no, you know, well I'll, I'll just tell you, it's humbled. like, I know, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. I thank you for calling me out on that shorthand bullshit term. I, I, I just mean, it's like, it's hard and I make mistakes. And I know there's people that um, came into a room and in a given moment, I didn't see the thing or I was tired or they were tired or whatever that thing that happens in a moment where you've got four minutes to meet somebody and you miss somebody and um, and fortunately it's not a definitive answer and it doesn't it's like someone's I tell myself you know someone's life does not depend on this and 99.99999 percent of all actors that have been in the world have not gone to Juilliard. So there's there's lots of different ways to get where you want to go. And world history, but yes. probably a good number of the, the No, I mean good number of working actors right now, not even just in the world, in America. You know, you don't have to have gone to that yes, school yeah. or any school, in fact, to um, learn your craft and succeed. Um, there's lots of different ways to do it. And so what that process is, is to the best of the, the people who um, are looking at the audition's ability to discern these things um, and have a sense that they will thrive at Juilliard given what we do, those are the people that we take. And I think that's, a, that's as opposed to that's saying, okay, you're an actor, you're not an actor. I don't think that's what we're deciding. I, I see, I mean, uh... Well, it sounds like you're you're thinking of the possibility that you might miss, uh, you know, someone good and and that. Oh, I know we do. I know I do. I've done it. I. Yeah, but then the, okay. There's also sometimes you you might think you you get disappointed later on when you have the the group and it's like oh I guess these people this this or that person. Uh, doesn't. Yeah, I mean that that has happened too. That's not doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen, and and often that has as much to do with, again not necessarily about potential and talent and ability um, in terms of that definition of living in imaginary circumstances, but other things in a person's life at that moment, which would be true for any kind of schooling about whether they're really ready to train and whether they're really ready to go to school and other things that are going on in their personal life that make it possible for them to go to work at that moment and put in the hours and the stresses. And oh. th those are giant factors. Of course, so I, I can, yeah. and. I those are all the factors that, I mean, people can appreciate and it, it won't necessarily, they won't worry that it reflects on their even basic ability to do the thing that they love and hope to do. I, I just, what is it that, I mean, can you describe a, a, a something that you actually look for hmm. that you want to see it, or, or what, you know, what will come through, what, what has to be there? Yeah, I mean, I, I... We get asked that question a lot, as you may imagine, when people want to apply, they want to say, they ask us, well, so what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, we have a whole bunch of answers that we give them that are very annoying. Like, well, no, we're looking for you. We'll know what we see in the room. Just be yourself. And, and, and all those things are true. 
Um, but if you put me on the spot, there's a thing that sometimes happens, and it may happen only for a moment or two, what, they're, what, this, what the auditioners are asked to do, just by the way, as a point of information, as a way of starting. They're usually asked to do two different monologues, one a quote-unquote classical monologue, which is often Shakespeare or sometimes the Greeks or Moliere or something like that, and one a quote-unquote contemporary monologue, which is often anything from, I don't know what contemporary is anymore, but let's say from the mid-20th century on. Um, 20th century. Um, and there's a moment where suddenly um, something happens where, and I, I, it's hard to explain, and it sounds a little um, wooey or something, where somebody drops in, and now this is where we get into these the language that is totally unscientific and totally subjective, where you feel like they they have connected to the story that they're telling and something about um, they're living through it in some way. They're not performing it. Um, and some aspect of their own humanity um, is put on the line and you see something revealed and you almost, um, this is highly subjective. But I, I think I know. Feel it, feel it in the room. And I, sometimes you feel like, oh, some, some energy, some palpable sensation is, is shifted in the room. What's been interesting and challenging is because of the pandemic, We've had to do a lot of our work on uh, online on Zoom as we are doing now, yeah. um, and and I was very much um, skeptical slash in despair that we'd be able to tell anything or do anything, and it turned out I was wrong, and that actually someone living through something in the moment in front of your eyes is turns out to be a palpable sensation that you can feel um, even, even Dan on Zoom. Hmm. And we don't need to see somebody do it even in a sustained way. Sometimes you see it for a moment or two and you have a, a hunch or a flash that there it is and we can help that come out some more. And uh, I guess I'm surprised because, you know, look, I, I'm not good at, uh, my eyes are not even looking in the right place, and zoom, there's right. background noise, and it's fuzzy. And I don't know that I've ever uh, gotten the same effect watching an actor in a movie that I have, I don't know, in a very intimate theatrical setting. Yeah, uh, uh, that's very rare, too, actually. And I have seen that in movies in ways that it always amazes me, because so much in the movie is being, the experience that we're having, as I, as I know, because you're, you have a great appreciation of, of film is happening through the director and the cuts and the music and the lighting and you know and the editing but still there's some actors who who because of what they're doing you 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 see life come in front of you i'm thinking of um for someone like i've seen julianne moore is one of my favorite film actors i think she's terrific it's really yeah uh... i feel like I remember watching um, uh, uh, Glenn Gary Gunn Ross, the film, which, and I know the yeah. play very well. I mean, it's filled yeah. with fabulous actors. I mean, there's like, every one of those actors in that film is great. But the scene that jumped out for me as having more life, more in the momentness, more revealed is the scene between um, Al Pacino and Jonathan Price in the restaurant where he's trying to, do you know the film, Dan? Yes, yes, and, they're and he's, selling something but he doesn't describe it. he's not really trying to sell him a, and he's giving he's not selling him the land he's 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 selling him a dream yeah 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 and i uh, i actually uh i think i'm not a fan of that movie uh no i i well 
the movie aside, I, I feel like that, or that, or that. I'm just citing examples where you wouldn't have sold me. Let me tell you, I okay, just, <laughs> I just, uh, I want to, okay. I want to come to who are, who are great actors just a little bit later, but I, I want to, so I don't know, you're auditioning these people. Uh, and mm -hmm. if they, uh, if they move you, how they're in, I, or uh, I mean, I can't, how much, how often does that happen? If you can tell that they're, this is a, this is a performance. This is a, this is a fake, this is a show mm -hmm. that that's not, they don't, they're not doing it. Is yeah. I, I, you know, I feel like, um, one of the th things that I, I, I guess I was just trying to go for the, no, I, this is a very crude, uh, no, I mean, it's the right question. And I, and I, and I, and I, as I say, it's something I wrestle with all the time. And it's like, um, I know, I, you know, I go, I know it when I see it. I mean, if it were really clear, all the teachers at school would agree about who we like, which we do not. And also the same people, all the same people would get into all the schools. Let's just take in grad schools or the, the top schools in the nation and in England and, or wherever in the world, right? They'd all, but that's not even true that the same 16 people get into, let's say, Juilliard and NYU grad acting and Yale and, I don't know, UCSD or ACT or all the same people in England get into RADA and Central and Guildhall, but they don't because it's there's, a, there's an element of uh, subjectivity or personal response or I believe you or I... Uh, uh, you know, I respond to you. That is always going on with with acting. Yeah, of course, I don't even uh, people don't have the same preferences about the football players in the draft. Yes, that's right. Yeah, well, I, I don't think that's a bad analogy, actually. And I remember reading um, a very interesting article by Malcolm Gladwell about choosing quarterbacks, and there was this long article in the New York this several years ago about why the NFL is so bad at it. And how Tom Brady, you know, is what was on the sixteenth round or something. Well, there's no sixteen. You know. It's the sixth round. Sixth, sixth round, whatever it was. It's like, yeah. uh, but well, then they need to fit into a team. Uh, uh, but but uh, but on the other hand, I, I think uh, I could almost be. I, I know what the job of those like American Idol judges are, are like. You know, I feel like I can evaluate singing. Yes. Here, right? do I like it or not? And am I? I don't know. Am I moved by the? person singing that's maybe even a more that's a little bit more subjective yeah. but at least is someone uh, hitting the notes and whatnot I, well just... yeah what's interesting i mean for instance so at juilliard for instance they there's a music division and a dance division right and they're auditioning people too but the, the musicians like they've all been many of them practicing their instruments since they were four yeah and the dancers to be, too. I know what it means to be good at an instrument. So. That's right. And the level of technical skill and practice, and they can play the notes or you can't play the notes. You can do that pirouette or you, you know, you can't do the pirouette. There's a level of technical expertise what as, you, what as well as artistry, you know, that, that, so it's a level for acting. We have people, Dan, who come and audition for us who've done almost none. Yeah. And you're making a, you're, there's it's it's about potential and possibility and personhood and a, so I can't, a, I can't imagine yeah. I can't imagine what it means you're, you're not no one's training and acting at four or you know, or, you know they, they've never lived you know they don't that's right so we're in a very different process as opposed to let's say the music and dance division who are taking people with a, a level of skill and there's a floor below which okay you've got to be able to do xyz you got to play that sonata. You got to be able to, you know, to do that, and then the then the level of subjectivity comes into play, or sense of um, potential and possibility, which is also a big part of what we're looking for, which is highly subjective. I mean, that's a that's a category thing. I want to know what that is because first of all, you have to choose. Someone has to have something in order to in order for you to want to yes. take them, and then you have to th then you have to give them. Or you know, put, have a program that hopefully gives them something else. 
right? So no one's yes. Presume, I don't know how many people you've ever seen who you thought like that's already a like a pro. That no, well, I, I, I've, I've occasionally we'll see somebody and we go like, why would you want to come to school? And we'll ask that question to somebody. It's like, well, and some of these people already have started on a career. It's like, well, what do you need? What do you want? Why do you want to come to school now? You're even having some success. What do you, where do you want to grow? What do you, you know, and. Uh, certainly if they already have a career, I guess I was talking about just, just the quality of. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think because the training is about a sense that you want to have a skill set. So let's say you're 18 and you can do certain things and the, the industry will hire you now for what you want to do, but they won't care about you in three years when you can't play those teenagers anymore. They'll get a new teenager. It's how you want to grow. What other skills do you want to have? How, how will you have a 30, 40, 50 year career, not a two year career? And um, to take your ability to be alive and, and live in, in the range that you tend to work in now and expand that and, and expand the possibilities of what you might be able to do. What, is, what does that mean? Uh, you know, someone either can live truthfully or, or not, and now they can. Ju it's just a matter of trying out it, this kind of circumstance or this kind of thing or that. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, in a certain sense, well, I mean, uh, one of my favorite lines in a, in a play is um, Children of a Lesser God, which they also made into a movie. I don't know if you've seen that, but there's one of, the, one of the characters has this great line, which I think about all the time, which is, is we keep recreating ourselves in our own image. And that is to say, we tend to, as human beings, identify with certain parts of ourselves we behave in a certain way. We work in a certain range of responses and expressions and experiences and perceptions. And we stay in that little range. And as you can imagine, there's some very successful actors who work in a, in a relatively narrow range and can have very successful careers. I think the, the and, the, and even no judgment around that, that's a certain kind of acting, I think. Sorry, what was the last thing you said? I said no judgment around that. That's a certain kind of legitimate kind of acting. And I, I, but I feel like that idea that one, one might be bigger than one thinks, that there might be aspects of self and self-expression and experience that you haven't had um, and that you could live through and express might be larger than your personality or who you are now is one of the aspects of the training. And, um, that's one of the things we want to help people do. And I guess we want to find people who are curious about that. And it's our best guess that there's lots more to them than where they're starting. I see. I, I just, I mean, there's probably a lot of different things that you do, but maybe I, I just want to know what is the difference between the, what are the things that you like can train and the things that can't be trained. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, I'm finding that out all the time. I, I it, it, there is no. I, I just, I just want to say, there's, I have zero definitive answers. Um. And it is one of the great things about my job is, um, is a continual questioning about what we're doing. I have a great colleague down at NYU at Grad Acting who talks about, um what we're doing is like a working theory, which I guess really means a hypothesis, right? We're working more based on a hypothesis. If I understand the definition between a theory and a hypothesis, but I'll let you answer that one. But um, um, that we have sort of some working theories about what's useful and what's helpful for a person to grow and change and find their biggest capacities and move out of their own um, tendencies and habits to find their fuller self and there's a whole series of classes and exercises that are designed handed down from teacher to teacher revised in order to do that but you can't take a person who uh is either very uh you know completely self-conscious or very you know, 
fake it performative and when they're asked to do something and and get them to be and have you know uh, how is that a thing that uh, I guess I guess I guess we're taking people in to, to our school that to the best of our ability to discern which is um, no small statement to say to the best of our ability to discern seem to us there's a lot of provisors here to the best of our ability to discern that seem to us to have um, not only the a nascent or more than nascent ability to live under imagining imaginary circumstances and reveal their humanity that have an ability to um, grow, change, and expand their range of experience and expression. And that is a hunch bet based on collective experience and quote unquote wisdom. Ha ha ha. Mm. Uh, so. How about this? Why, why does a person want to act? Well, that's a really good question. And I, I will say, I, 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 let me start with my own experience because, as you may or may not know, um, I got all I got into this because I started out as an actor, mm. um, and actually, there's a wonderful quote from the great um, actor Olympia Dukakis. Do you know who she is? I know uh, who she is. You know what? I just watched this movie, Moonstruck. Oh, she's fabulous in that. There's so many great actors in that. So many great. great uh, also, I knew of her name from a Simpsons reference where I think it was a joke. She was starring in a movie called Too Many Grandmas. <laughs> Probably a wonderful actress, but she said, I'm, I, I hope I'm not butchering her quote too, too badly, but uh, she said, you know, the reasons why one remains as an actor or stays in our, our craft and profession are not the same reasons that you get into, that, you, that you've gotten into it. And I'd say, thank goodness. And I, I will say for myself, it was it's fun and it's great to get applause and it's great to get laughs. You know what I mean? There's a kind of the high of the performative element. And, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks get into it for that reason. And, and, and sort of that's, that's a part of it. And I think um, that's certainly why I got into it and I really enjoyed it. And I, and I found I had a certain skill in performative work and, and uh, had a certain comic flair and getting laughs is one of the great highs that there could possibly be. And I yeah. followed that and I did, um, you know, a lot of acting in college. Well, I was in a lot of plays in college. You had done acting before college? Yes, I did through um, in the summer times going to various arts camps, stuff like that. Hmm. Um, and like, you know, just enjoying the theater, loving the movies, but I really didn't know what it was about. It was, um, I think, I think I would have called myself, uh, a performer entertainer and, and again, without judgment around that, but I wouldn't, as I understand it now, I wouldn't have called myself ever an actor. And then I wound up. Um, eventually uh, going to a, an acting school, a very fine drama school in its, in its time, um, the American Conservatory Theater in, in San Francisco, which was a conservatory attached to a, a wonderful repertory company in San Francisco. And I think for the first time then, Dan, I met what I would consider real actors. And I, I noticed that what they were doing what my classmates were doing was, was different from what I was doing. I think I tried to look up that that place and who, what, what age did, was Denzel Washington there? Yes, what? he was, uh, Mr. Washington was there several years after me. Oh, years after, okay. So. And um, Annette Benning was there almost like maybe a year or two after I was there. Uh-huh, okay. I don't think anybody particularly well-known came out of the years that I was there as a, as a student. Doesn't mean they're not good actors or working actors, but those are the two, two of their most famous grads. They, they were there after I was there. 
It was a very fine school with some excellent teachers. And I, um, I began to see that what other people were doing were different from me. And I'll, I'll tell you this, this story, um, which was sort of eye-opening for me, but something I was never able to, or, or slash, to be honest with you, Dan, willing to change. Um, so we used to, pref we, we, we'd have um, days where we'd work on scenes for, and then those scenes would be presented for a bunch of teachers. And in fact, at ACT, um, they, we performed them for like um, the entire student body, which was a little strange and not how most schools do it now. Or um, in any case, we perform scenes and the, all the different acting teachers would be there and critique them after we did them. And um, I got some praise initially. And then I remember doing a scene um, from uh, Long Day's Journey Into Night by Eugene O'Neill. I don't know if you know that. I know that title. Right. It's one of the, Sydney Lumet, maybe. Like, it's, it's like one of the, the monumental works of American theater. Uh, anyway, it wasn't the big major, major scene at the end of the play. It was sort of a, but an interesting and challenging scene in the middle of the play between the two brothers, Amy and Jamie and Edmund. And I worked on it and my friend um, and I worked on it. And um, after we did it, the, the great, there was this terrific, theater director or acting teacher named Alan Fletcher, who was sort of the main acting teacher at that school. And he stood up and he said, um, you know, he said, Richard is maybe our most proficient actor at the school. And I, and I go, proficient? Hmm. And I'm going, is that good? Bad? I had a feeling it wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that might mean in terms of acting. Well, wait, he doesn't finish. He said, so he said, Richard always knows how it should go, what is right, and that's what he always does. And there's never a moment of surprise or spontaneity or revelation. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it was like, ah. Oh. I see. I see the issue here. <laughs> well, and that was true. I was, I understood everything, and I was directing it and planning it and performing it, uh, sort of very cleverly, which fooled some people for some of the time up to some point, and then at a certain moment, it was like, oh, he's not. There's there's nothing in here that is surprising or rev revelatory. And that is not something that I ever was able to achieve. And I, be I also began to realize, Dan, that maybe that was something I was not interested in doing, that that art, that um, there's a, um, George Bernard Shaw said that acting was the art of personal revelation raised to the optics of the theater. We'll talk about the second half of that sentence later, but that that willingness to put yourself on the line and live through something and maybe something about your own humanity and your own vulnerability or what's going on with you might be revealed while you're doing that. Uh, I would say in retrospect, at that moment in my life, I was not interested in doing because I didn't really know myself and I would be damned if I would reveal something about who I was before I knew it. I wanted to control everything. And so I- That makes, okay. All right, I was interested in control and which probably makes me a better director than an actor. Obviously, I, I see. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. But you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, be willing to try if if it were possible giving that up just just to you could appreciate uh, his his uh, critique or his sense of what acting you know ought to be. Mm -hmm. But you're saying you weren't willing. To even try to, to, I mean, I hey, if someone, to, uh, this is no, no. I, I thought con uh, uh, there's a difference between what I, my conscious mind said it wanted and what my unconscious. I just, 
I, only in retrospect was what I realized afterwards that actually, if I'd really wanted to do that, I would have done it, but I really didn't want to at that moment in my life. Really? But, okay, but actually- so That was not a conscious thought. It was only later. This is this has brought up a, a whole bunch of things that I, I wanted to get to later. I mean, I started by saying, okay, um, why does a person want to act? And you, yes. mentioned, you know, young kids or, or teenagers, if, if there's a high school play or something, I mean, it, I was in my fifth grade play and yeah, it was mm -hmm. fun. I mean, I knew, you know, I put on a costume, you, you say the lines and people clap and there's a performative a aspect to it. And it, it's just, that's why it's called a play. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, uh, so some people get attracted to that and then they, or they like, I don't know, some other theater that they've seen or, or movie, I don't know, I, blah, 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 like this is what that, kind, right. that's that right. kind of thing and they want to do that. There's also, which what you haven't mentioned, of course, what I'm sure draws some people to this is uh, fame and fortune and they yeah, sort of sure. a star, right? That, that's, a, that's another thing that's out there. Those two things I can understand, right? Mm -hmm. even, if, even if I'm, I don't say, I don't think that's the path to becoming a good actor, desiring either of those two things, yeah. but, but at least that I can understand. But the, the actual doing of the acting is that uh, when, when it comes to the real thing, like what, what you say it ought to be, mm -hmm. I mean, how many people are drawn either to that process or the, the doing of it and, or either what it feels to, to do the real thing does it have for you, as you said, that you want control? That's something I understand. I mean, as an artist, I understand because I, if I love movies from an early age, I mean, at, at some point, I think earlier than, uh, you know, Tarantino talks about how he loved movies, but for a long time, you know, he watched movies, who's on the screen, the actor, and thought at first he wanted to be an actor. Right. I, I think at some point, I, I forget when, but it was certainly by the time I was 12 and like Kubrick, I mean, I, I understood the director makes the movie. Yes. Right, the dire it's the director's vision that we're seeing. And so I wonder, what is it to be the actor? The actor gets to live the life, I guess, but, but uh, is the actor the, the creative visionary of the work? What, what is it to the actor? Mm -hmm. What is the thrill for the actor? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think, well, well uh, I think it's different for ultimately for theater and movies, because I do think it's true that the director and the editor are finally the, the artists in control in, the, in TV and movies. Uh, I do think it's true that the actor is at the center. Well, it's not the I'll actor's words or vision. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not. Actually, I mean, in, in, you're not there, there. It, it's a bunch of different things. I mean, to enter, for some folks, it seems to be, to enter into an imaginary life and live through it and begin to experience and express things that transcend your own life and yet feel somehow personal to you, that's deeply paradoxical is highly fulfilling and a drive for some people. And I, and I feel like over my years, I've met young people who are from all over the world and from Nowheresville, America, and here and in India, South Africa, Iceland, you know, that, that there's these actors and they come most to life living in a meta reality that there's something that is deeply fulfilling and meaningful for them. And it also, it doesn't preclude it being mixed up with wanting applause or wanting laugh or even wanting fame and fortune that those things may or may not be in the mix for them and they have to sort that out. Um, and eventually they also have to sort out the aspect of just trying to make a living. Do you know what I mean? Um, but, but, but let me just, I just want to focus on, imagine, the, I don't know, the picture of acting I might've had a, a long time ago, which is, you know, the director has a vision of what sort of story he wants to tell mm -hmm. and there's people in it. And he wants those people, he wants every, every expression should be a particular thing. Like he knows, he knows what this, these characters should feel, what they should project. Imagine if you could, you know, script out, you know, every, every emotion and then every facial expression. 
every delivery of every line. Well, like I, mechanically. Yeah, so I, 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 they, I'm not sure that that's an accurate description of what no, most it, directors it, it want. Turns out, it turns out that that uh, doesn't really work. And right. uh, that's not right. the theory of acting that people have had for now well over a hundred years and, and mm -hmm. probably even before. But there are, I think, some uh, some film directors who really tell exactly the actors exactly what they want from everything. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that uh, acting is this. You can imagine that the actor, if, if the director wasn't there to tell you that, if the uh, actor had to intellectually figure out what would be right to to see and how should you mm -hmm. say the line so that it's exact it expresses that that thing. Instead, it turns out that. Uh, very few people can pull this off. It's almost this um, impersonation, almost. Uh, it doesn't come across like what we actually recognize as good acting. The good acting really is this entirely this other thing where there's very little of that uh, mechanical scripting and you have to you it, it, somehow living truthfully and giving it as, as though it were real behavior mm -hmm. as that character and doing it organically Convey, conveys that thing that right. instead of manipulating it or showing it yes right so but on the on the uh, however that that second thing i don't know what does that feel like i guess i had the experience i think in in my very few better attempts at uh, mm -hmm. doing these exercises mm -hmm. i it had the feeling of not being in control Yes, and really, and not being aware, you know, losing track of something and being off off the rails of just reacting without without thinking, right? Some that that was uh, it, it only happened a few times, mm -hmm. and I, I thought this is probably. I mean, I never got to see myself, but I, th this is probably what it's more re what it's when it's better. Yes. Okay. But. But why does a per do, do, do people get some kind of thrill from that? Because as you say, the, the lack of control, you're not, you know. No, I, I, that's a great question. I mean, I do, I, I feel like there's, there's a moment, not, not to get too pretentious about it, but that kind of transcendence and, a, and release briefly from self-consciousness and and um the restrictions that come with control is is um something that all human beings seek in one form or another some level of transcendence and i think it's a form of it and i had those tastes too once or twice and i've certainly had it um even when i'm working as a director and a teacher where you're creating in the moment and you feel like you're in touch with something um, and you're not totally in control of it. And, and someone once said that all great art involves the revelation of something that the artist is not totally in control of, that you work very hard on your craft and you work through a conscious process to find, this is what Stanislavski said, you work from a conscious process to an unconscious result that things will happen that you have not planned. And I, not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, it's it's a high, it's transcendent to trans, we're so stuck in ourselves and who we are, that's the, what I meant by that quote about, we keep recreating ourselves in our own image. And for, to briefly transcend our own little plan and live just spontaneously, um, you know, it's why people, some people do physical things for escape or take drugs or alcohol or, you know, to transcend briefly. Um, and um, maybe that's one of the things that's going on there. Well, I guess, I don't know, I can imagine, it, you know, if someone told me that was the thrill, that's why they want to act, because they, they get a thrill from doing that, I guess it would make sense to me, although I just don't know what it takes. I, I've tried, you know, I, I can't achieve that with yeah. any regularity and uh and, but then it also strikes me as a, a very different thing from the kind of creative pursuit that i feel like i understand a little bit better which is scripting the thing yeah. the story making you know the whole vision of the well thing. one of the things about an actor but also about 
a dancer or a musician is you're not purely a creative artist in, in, the, in the purest sense or a painter. You're 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 an interpretive artist. You you find your freedom and expression within somebody else's form, and you've got to be willing to. Well, these are the words I have to say, and I have to go there, and I have to hit my mark, and I have to have my light, and there's all these these structures and forms, and within which I'm I'm free, and I find life and freedom within that. And some some interpretive artists like that. Some of them balk at it after a while. Um, some you know like no, just tell me where to stand, where to go, and and I like that. Others want want more quote unquote freedom. Um, but it's a very particular type of creativity. It's creativity within a structure. Yeah, that's I guess I've never heard that interpretive artist. I mean, what they're doing is it's somehow, there's, maybe there's an art to it, but it, yeah, it's someone else's vision. Are they, you're the tool of, of some- Yes, you're part of, you're part of something that's bigger than you. So a good actor, it seems to me, and this is something that's a value that I would say of a, of a, a, a Juilliard, especially is is you're there to serve the story to serve the writer you have to understand what the playwright or the screenwriter and or the director is trying to do in the story you're trying to tell and your personal individual choices have to be in some way connected to the bigger picture and understand that you are part of a bigger whole and there's then there's um deep satisfaction in being part of that and understanding what your role is and finding your freedom and full expression within something that is already structured for you. So if you're doing a play or a script, it's like, well, these are the words I have to say, and these are the words I have to say in the order in which they they come. I mean, I, I, my sense is in movies, there's a lot more freedom for a lot of actors to improvise. But, um, you know, you still have to like, and I have to stand here and I have to walk to this moment or I won't be in my light, right? And, or I have to speak loud enough, otherwise I won't be heard. All that, this, 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 and this. And how, how I must person, be completely free and spontaneous. Yeah, well, how does how does a person hold those two things at the same, how, how can a person live uncontrolled and spontaneous and and, and be the kind of, who would stand and, and project yeah. out and-, and Yeah, and good that. question. It's deeply paradoxical and 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 possible because I've I've seen it and it's thrilling both for the audience and and the person who's doing it. And it, I'll be honest with you, even it's actually pretty rare. The great the great um, stage director Lloyd Richards. Um, one of the most important theater directors in America. He directed the first production of Raisin in the Sun, and he directed and helped um, develop all of, almost all of August Wilson's plays. These are all names I don't know. So August Wilson is the great African-American writer, um, died a couple of years ago, and Lloyd Richards uh, um, was a great theater director starting in the 50s. Um, and all through into the 80s and 90s. But, and I was lucky enough to sit down on one of his acting classes and he used to talk about when he thought it was real theater, when you're sitting in the audience and you feel like anything can happen. And yet, and that's true for an actor too, it's like, and at the same time, you know what the next line is, you know how Hamlet's gonna end, but moment by moment, somehow, you fool yourself, trick yourself into not knowing. And it's possible. I don't know how the brain does it, but, but that one thing happens at a time and it's as if the experience is unfolding in front of you for the actor and the audience in the moment. That's, hmm. that's the, that's to me the, the, pinnacle and uh, of, of what might be possible um, at the highest form of acting and and it feels like an improvisation even though it's not I wonder if I ever I ever you know uh, 
thought that way or could have, you know, had that imagination doing uh, scenes I was supposed to do? I, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I wasn't. Well, I, I, as I say, it's even for good actors. That's even even then. It's 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 fairly rare. I mean, imagine imagine Dan like being in a show eight times a week, you know, and. I didn't like doing it twice, which I had. Right, and having to be, and, and match, you know, it's like, you can give a good performance and it'd be there and it'd be strong and believable, but to achieve those moments of really not knowing and it feeling like, as Lloyd Richards would say, anything could happen, that's doesn't happen all the time. You're working, you're, you're, you're working towards that um, in the same way any artist is working and working and playing their craft for some moment that really of true coming together of spontaneity and craft, you know, where suddenly something springs springs to life in a surprising way that's not totally in their control, but is the fruits of of labor and grace. And it happens. And some people devote their life to that. I guess I've seen I've seen some exercises that uh, you know were unscripted okay. and, and just went along and where really I guess anything yeah. would have happened. Right, but then the trick would be so right, and I've done that in my class too, in my exercises. And then the trick is like, okay, how would you do that eight times a week? Oh man, uh, and it's not you know, it's it's not, it's, I'm not, I'm not sure it's possible, but it's something that you have out there. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons why people love sports so much, is the spontaneity and the creativity of it and the flash of a of an amazing moment happening unpredictably is so exciting that they're willing to you know you put up with a lot of things to to find yeah. that. a lot of laps around that track uh, hoping well, there'll be a crash i suppose but uh, well that, that's putting it in the most negative terms yes but i mean you know um there's yeah people put narratives on and hope that some great play will happen and it does i mean and you yeah. know and there's a lot of like you know three yards in a cloud of dust or nothing that happened or you know some boring but stuff I, I don't know that that's the only i mean okay i'll, I'll tell you that the thing that i finally learned to be to like about theater which i never did before is that i, I that a person with a very strong I call it emotionality, for lack of a better word, because they're they're experiencing emotion, and I feel like it's real. And I found that I actually could, yes, wanted to it. That there's something, something there, and there's like a, yeah, it sort of almost it shocks you, or or something that you were actually feeling something, watch, watching someone else, and it, 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 it was real or, or not. I mean, people have yelled. Yes, it, that's such an interesting real. phenomenon. Let's go back to the beginning of our conversation, that it's not just the actor who has an experience, but maybe more importantly, actually, than the actor having the experience is the audience having an experience. That you could watch something that you palpably know is not real and be moved. And that someone's experience in a fiction but would, is it, is would it, affect you. Okay, so you that's kind of extraordinary, and I and and um, I, I more and more I've come to believe, especially uh, for lots of obvious reasons about the way we live now, and I think we've discussed this before that people are not clearly not persuaded by logical argument. They're clearly not even persuaded by obvious facts. That what moves people are stories, and oh, okay, I. I I, I was with you and then stories maybe, I, but I, I actually think, I, was, I thought you were going a different direction with this where people are moved by particular kinds of people. Yes. Who have a certain affect who do something. I mean, I think that the, I, I, I have a hypothesis here that this part of the, you know, the, what, for whatever reason I, I can't act well, it's probably the same kind of reason that I can't command like a class of second graders i've never tried to do it. imagine that i wouldn't do it like when i tell them to sit down it doesn't it doesn't happen whereas a person who somehow conveys something else some for you know 
or that reaches people when they say sit down to, to a group of, can can do this yes no I, I think that's true too that I, I think that's related but separate from the power of myths and stories I, I guess I'm talking okay, about you were talking about something uh, 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 that but I can believe that people's, people's minds are open and hearts are open by watching a play or a movie about a group of people that they hated and feared and then they watch a story and they watch them live through something it's like oh my god they're human too in a way that you could explain to them that they're human or so show them a bunch of things and i suppose uh, i i just like I, I like data and statistics that would tell me yeah. about this or that. yeah but now people are not built that way i okay but 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 about the people i do actually think though that I mean, yeah, a director can write that that story that will reach people, and he'd never be the one to convey that em emotionality. It's a, it's a different, it's a person, it's an actor who does that. And I'm trying yes. to think about what is it, I mean, what is it that's there? And I don't, is it just that Im imagination? Is it just, because I, I was willing to commit, I, I believe in that, the theory of acting. And yet, I, I don't know if I, my imagination would, but, but, but also, I don't know if I, do I feel things enough myself or do I project the way that it ought to, the way that it will hit someone else mm -hmm. by being too ironic and self uh, examining or something. I'm just never, I'm never doing that. Even my sense of to telling someone to do something, it, I'm like already thinking there's some joke there because I know people won't do as I. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can relate to that because I, I feel like um, believing the ability to believe and gender belief for yourself makes other people believe too. That's another kind of formulation about acting. That um, if, for you know, I'll say to an actor or other teacher, so if you begin to believe, I will begin to believe. In some weird way, belief is um, contagious. And a lot of what I'm working on in my early years is the different um, crafts and techniques that an actor might use to enhance their natural talent to believe and how you engender belief in what's not actually there. That sounds like the kind of thing that could probably help even those people who uh, were not so good or- uh, Yes, but that's, that's, it does, that's, it works, there's a craft, there is a craft. I see, I didn't realize, oh, okay, because that's the, that's the, you know, this basic thing that you're trying to train. How, how do you get them, how do you, how can you improve that? How can you do that? I mean, I, there's very little that's original with me. I mean, I have, you know, I went to school and observed certain teachers just because I'm sort of, that cliche of those who can't do teach, or not, but you know, what I heard from other teachers, what I observe, what I practice in myself, what I begin to see in this big experiment, this working hypothesis of what seems to help um, engender belief, reduce self-consciousness, which, which you talked about, reduce the desire to perform and begin to help an actor live. And there are certain exercises and techniques that do seem to be useful. Can you just give an example of one of those uh, early exercises? Um, I do, I, because this was handed down to me and I think it does really work, um, do a fair amount of work in using the senses to um, imagine stimuli that aren't there using touch smell and what i learned is that you don't actually have to feel or, or see or smell those things but if you're asking um what it would be like if those things were there that that is often enough to begin to concentrate and relax your body and make it present for other things to happen that's a very abstract way of talking about these things and it's very hard to explain as opposed to 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 live through but i will tell you this that imagination is not in is is a body process so i 
I make a distinction, and this is not original with me, but from another acting teacher named Earl Gister, who used to talk about making a distinction between thinking about something and imagining something, that those are two different functions. Okay? That thinking, if I had to, and this is entirely incorrect, but I identify with thinking, which is a very important part of any process. I, I, I identify that with the, you know, cerebral cortex and you have to make some decisions in thinking, whereas imagining, I think, is a body function. That when you're imagining, the body is somehow involved. And we're embodied creatures, we're sensing creatures, and somehow getting the body to believe in an imaginary reality is what's what I find really helpful and a key part of my teaching. Hmm. The body begins to... Um, believe or act as if or um, that it's somewhere and then when the body begins to believe everything begins to happen that for the time being anyway and maybe this will change in a hundred or two hundred years and we'll down we'll become one with our computers but right now we're still bodily creatures uh, that's interesting I guess um you know, what you're describing, it doesn't sound like anything, any kind of exercise exactly that, that I did in the, yeah. my, my group, which was very much focused on, on emotion and, but, uh, but, but except that uh, when we did character work, yeah. there was, the, the, the idea was, you know, to first figure out, you know, the, 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 there's a costume and a physicality and just work on those things. Yeah. Just do those things, you know, th think about it and work it that way. Then maybe you will inhabit that. It's, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of doors in. I, I, I'm sure you've, you've heard of Stanislavski, who's sort of seen as sort of the founder of sort of a modern way of, of thinking about acting and, you know, moving very much away from a, at least a 19th century, very presentational style and trying to live through things and, he wrote some famous books and uh, about it and exercise, but he worked for many, many years and he, he thought a lot about how it was and he changed his approaches and he had no one of approaching. But I think people think of him mostly as working sort of psychologically and thinking about what the person wants and, you know, sort of what is known as from working from the inside to the outside. But there's a very famous episode. I think it's in one of his first books. I think it may be an actor prepares. I haven't, I'll be honest with you, I haven't. I need to read read those books. It's been a long time, probably since I was in drama school, since I read them, um, and maybe they'd mean a lot more to me now than they than they did then. But um, these books are sort of they're he uses sort of a, a fictional way of writing, and there's a, a um a student in the school who's not very good, and there's a teacher, and the student who keeps failing all his um, so it's written not quite like a novel, but sort of with a fish, fictional aspect to this how-to book. Um, yeah. And he does all these exercises badly. And one day this, this actor who can never do anything right just goes into the, like, the little costume shop in the theater and he does exactly what you're talking about. He just, he just gets some clothes and he finds this hat and, uh, and some clothes and he puts on some makeup and he looks in the mirror and suddenly sees this other person and he starts to behave and he suddenly, something is liberated in him. And he comes into class and he does this exercise and it's his first quote unquote successful exercise. And I always thought of that, that because I thought, well, that's not how I think of Stanislavski. I always think of Stanislavski as talking about answering the questions, who are you and what do you want and where are you coming from? And here this actor is pointing to his first successful actor. So it's like he got it from what he was wearing and the hat he had on. And, and um, I think it's a question of there's no one way to do it. It's all the different doors you can walk through that begin to help you begin to believe in some other reality and release you from a measure of self-consciousness and the desire to perform and to just begin to respond spontaneously. Um, uh, and, and live that 
that we're looking for, and there's lots of different ways to do it. I think one of the hallmarks of Juilliard is it's not, there's never been one way, it's not like a Meisner school, or, you know what I mean? It's like, you do some of this, and you do some of that. You do mask work, we do Stanislavski work, you... What was it for, oh, mask work, did you masks, say? Masks, yeah. Masks like in uh, Greek, uh, ancient Greek. Well, there's different kinds of masks. There's work. character masks that are more yeah. naturalistic. There's some that are very abstract, right. So you to, can just, you have the sad face. Yeah. Or uh, the happy face. Well, they're different. Face. Well, it's, it's more subtle than that, more nuanced. But yeah, I'll show you this mess. And some actors find that incredibly liberating. Well, I tried so hard to, to put on ridiculous clothes and change everything about the way I walked. And I tried to be a squirrel. And it, I don't know if right. I ever right. completely, I did it. I did the motion, but, but I, uh, uh, okay. So you, I mean, you do different things because there's different kinds, there's different kinds of acting, right? Is it, uh, is one, better a right for for another thing i guess i wonder you know who's uh people are still doing shakespeare but shakespeare yes. is different it's different from real behavior you know totally real behavior i i mean there's there's something a little bit performative in in shakespeare it's certainly in you know well I, musical theater that and then that world there's a there's a ton of uh there's stuff that's not not like real behavior I would just say there's a difference between what I'll call naturalism in art, which is a relatively recent invention. Mm. The okay. idea that art should look yeah. exactly like life. I mean, I only know examples of, you know, what Sophocles was or, uh, and, you know, there was a lot of mask work and the language was heightened and yeah. that the conflation of naturalism and behavior with truth of existence is just that, a conflation. They don't necessarily go together. That naturalism is a style in any art. So for instance, when I, the way that I helped me think about it is I, I really like the visual arts. I love painting and your grandmother took us to art museums all the time. Your mother and I spent many, many hours at the Met, let's say. That's um, a great place. I've spent hours at the Met. Okay. And uh, some of my favorite art is not naturalistic. It's early Renaissance before they're getting to look, before the goal is to be lifelike. It's sort of late, um uh, gothic when it's pretty flat and two-dimensional a yeah. lot of those are religious paintings Who's i really like that God. and also i like uh post-impressionism i like uh matisse cezanne yeah, yeah, and then later that. bonard and we you know we're clearly they're not trying to represent life they're getting it they're trying to get at something else about life um in non-naturalistic ways and it doesn't mean they can't do that matisse or picasso or bonard couldn't draw a figure that looked like a figure there's like i don't need to do that i can walk down the street and look at that i'm trying to find something else about the truth of life I, I, um, okay, I can get that, but I, but come on, I don't, I, I can't stand musical theater and I can't stand a lot of like comic acting in the theater. Doesn't do it for me. Right. I, well, I, I, I mean, I, certainly I there's matters of taste. I, I, I don't, uh, I've never learned to appreciate the opera. That was something as, even though we grew up in a house like filled with classical music, that was not something that was part of our household and your grandfather used to call it the uproar. Um, and I, it's, 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 it's an art that eludes me as well as some other people who- You don't understand, really you don't understand how it's, it's, it's dawn and this, the guy is coming down the stairs and he's gonna tell, you know, he has to sing. Why? Because here's how proud he is. He's happy to get to work because he's the factotum of the city. The whole city turns on him and he's the best at it because he is the barber 
who he knows all the gossip because he's the barber for all <laughs> the, fan the fancy ladies and the men and the whole city turns on him and he's he's just so happy to do it. He has to sing. He has to tell That's you. Right. La, 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 you know, <laughs> that makes sense to me. I'd watch that. Yes. Uh, right. No, I, I musicals make a lot of sense to me that somehow life gets so big the... <laughs> that the only way that the only that you must sing, that the truth is bigger than naturalism. I mean, if you you maybe this is a stretch, but from a physiological point of view or a physics point of view it what's from a physiological point of view um the surface of, of uh, looks very calm in a human body but if you get down on the cellular level right down in the on the cells in the mitochondria it's like things are going on there it's crazy it's you know enzymes are happening cells are being blown apart the the uh, on the cellular level, it's like um, huge forces and, and releases. And that's the truth about life, too. And certainly in terms of kidney stone and, is the truth of my life. Yeah, well, I mean, but there's the the placid surface of naturalism is not actually the truth of life. And it depends on where you want to look. And I sometimes think it's the it's the job of art to try to get so to the what back is the... of things or the the under the surface of things and so um you know certain artists are trying to find different ways of getting at at, at that certainly um music does that all the time there's some great truths there that are happening in music and you, you feel like it's power and it's truth and maybe because music never had the burden of of quote unquote verisimilitude that there's not a problem right do you, but do you see where i'm I, I i think there are whole um forms that involve acting where you're not imagine which i guess are not naturalistic and so the imagination is is different and also the effect that you might have on other people is different i mean the kind of performance that is comic and for laughs yes can it, it is just not the same thing it, 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 as a person who I can who can really you know, get angry or agitated at another person in, in right. dialogue and and that that feels real and I, I know that but the comic performance was was written and it, it's very performative I, I suppose people go some people like that is is it a different training to do that sort of thing I think they overlap and I think there are certain particular skills. Um, if, if you ask me, I, I, one of the things I don't think you can teach is, is for how to be funny. I, I do, that's something that seems to be innate to me. But I, I um, is it different? Actually, that's a, is it different? Uh, some of your students are, are are funny, and some are not. Uh, or the, I also I think, think I think there's a continuum, and then there's certain. I mean certain people have a it's a sensibility or a worldview or a personality that lends them to a sense of the comic and the absurd and just in their whole being and their point of view talk about something that's hard to put into words and ineffable ineffable that's that that would be that would be one of them well um, that's all i could achieve no one took me seriously but i could be an idiot you know and well, I, I don't think that should be frowned upon. I think I think comic actors are very important and very rare, and um, some of the best actors. Well, can you train someone to be I don't know like uh, Robin Williams or, or or Jim Carrey or something? They they really did a, a lot of. No, I you know if you ask me that I, I today I would say there's some things you can learn and to be better at at that, and then there's there's an essential thing that I think is that is. I'll say today that is innate and has to do with a, I don't know what it has to do with a worldview or how a mind works or point of view um, that um, a person embodies. And I'm not sure that, let me say this, I don't know that I could teach it. I do, I do think there's some comic tropes and lotsies that you can 
perform, and I think you can you can open up to a certain degree aspects of that in a performer. And in my limited experience, I would also say that there's an innate thing there that's going on that maybe ultimately cannot be taught. I guess I'm, I'm thinking of the first episode of this uh, show uh, starring Zach Galifianakis. Where he's uh -huh. in balloons or something. I forget what was it called. He, he goes, his character goes to France to study at this very elite school for, to, for clowns or mime uh -huh. or something. And, uh -huh. and the, everyone's you know better at it and he's trying to take notes he doesn't understand what the french guy is saying and then they <laughs> have them put on a costume and they do the fancy like clown dance and they're all prancing through the field and here's this guy at the back and he's still trying to get his pants on because he's got <laughs> pants and he's trying to do the thing that the other people are doing and he falls over and the thing is that the teacher fails he thinks he's a complete fool and of course the joke that's is right. he's that's the right. real clown that's the real you know, that's the person who's really funny, not these other people. Uh, I don't know what was the point of that. I, I, I certainly think that by virtue, I, if I, I can't be serious, I don't fit with. Yeah, know. no, I think it's a, I, to be honest, I think it's a cast of mind. I think is a, a worldview that's, that's, um, there may not even be language for that worldview um, that, that makes a person a comic actor, a clown, and uh, that's that's my that's my experience. Well, it makes more sense to me what stand up is because it's cerebral. Mm -hmm. what kind of mentality might might produce that kind of thing, but comic acting is so somehow in between, right? Because yes. the fool, but you also have to be an actor. It's a, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't. I guess I don't know. Um, uh, does acting? Uh, does acting? change over time hmm. well it's interesting i mean if you uh, if you look at films i mean what the a record we have now is a film record i mean there's some surmises about what acting was like people used to talk quite differently yes it's not even and, that and, many and i'd love i mean i i gosh i'd love to go back to elizabethan england in a time machine and watch those shakespeare plays and see what they were doing it's so interesting. I don't know if you know Hamlet's advice to the players. It's a very famous thing in in in, in Hamlet that, that he has a traveling troupe of actors and he talks to them about what he likes in I acting. I don't know Hamlet, but continue. Well, you should look at it because his advice to the players is very famous, which is it seems like he's talking about you need to be truthful and don't wave your arms about and speak naturally and you know, and oh. there's there's certain values that he seems to be espousing that we would recognize, mm. and yet also there seem to be some different tastes of the day about what people liked and and the different writers and what they were doing and and um, you know whatever you think of Shakespeare's language that basically iambic to mentameter is the rhythm of natural human speech of, in English. And that's what he's interested in. Um, but if you, but just going back to where we started, if you look at some of the acting from the, the, the original silent movies and the that's talkies that. and, you know, the early, you know, the, it, it seems much more performative and, um, um, external, yes, as 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 values. Um, Not really, but even in even into the early '60s, I still see movie where even the, the just the manner of speech, the regular manner of speech, is something that I don't recognize. Uh, hard to say, higher and and more yes. uh, my class somehow, and I, I don't. I, and I think that's well, a holdover from the theater and an idea of what it was supposed to sound like, and all a lot of that is is changing and that's one of the, some of the things that we've been wrestling with at the school for a bunch of years now you know what is that and to me i, I think uh marlon brando uh, is like the first modern actor that's as i know there could be others but i i, I see it just a huge change uh watching him it, it's uh it's like seeing a person out of time uh how, yeah how no but i mean the big i think the big difference there dan is what movies 
and TV allow and also um, select for. It's very different from the theater. So imagine having to do a performance, you know, in a big theater with two balconies, right? So I, I had that George Bernard Shaw quote the other the earlier in our conversation, which is he said that, that acting was the art of personal revelation, right? but raised to the optics of the theater, which as I understood it means like, it's got to be true and it's got to be personal and some revelation, but people have to see it in the second balcony, which means also means raised to the acoustics of the theater. Yeah. So they have to hear it too. And in a scene that naturalistically in your life, you would whisper to somebody, that was what would be true. You have to find a way to convey it's a whisper and have that be truthful. And yet the people in the second balcony hear you. That's an extremely interesting artistic problem. Yeah. How something can be truthful and heard in the second balcony. What movies obviously allow you to do with the microphone right there is to not worry about any of that. There's other things to worry about, which is I got to hit my light and all those things. But those are things that are less. Um, I guess film actors have to pretend there isn't a camera. In that's the right. Yeah, we're like right in their face yeah, or right. that right off camera, right off frame. There's like 60,000 guys there, you know, with all these cables and stuff like that. And 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 we only see what's in the frame. And if you would pull back to reveal, you see like, oh, my God, all that stuff was around it. It's just different challenges of of belief, but it's certainly in terms of voice and speech. Um, they're very different uh, challenges and, and, and things that you can do or not do. I mean, you in on screen, you convey that you've had a change of thought by a shift in your eye. Whereas if you just did that on the stage, that would not be visible. That's right. Well, this is part of the, how, how much of a disaster it was for me. I mean, I, I, I was struggling to trying to do well in the exercises, which I, I just trying to make a little progress. But then when you if suddenly we have to do scenes on a stage, now there's lights, first of all, which means basically I don't see any, I'm, I'm <laughs> spending my whole time, forget about any acting, I'm spending my whole time just trying to keep my eyes open and not for squinting basically the whole time. And then there's all these challenges of you're know, always having to sort of cheat out, step forward, instead. Uh, basically, the the demands of putting on a theatrical performance yes. killed what what tiny progress I might have made. It was just all a totally different thing, and uh, I, for all kinds of reasons, am not a big fan of the theater. But well, I I I, I, I had the privilege of speaking with an extremely famous actor a couple of years ago, someone who's maybe one of the great actors of, of our time. And he talked about, he hasn't, he hasn't appeared on the stage in a long time and will not because the kind of acting he wants to do and what he considers truthful and rev revelatory he feels cannot be done on the stage. And he talked about a very particular experience of working on a Shakespeare play in a theater that was so big that he felt it was designed almost a theater that no one could succeed. And he stopped doing plays since then and only has done film because for him, it allows him to do um, what he considers the kind of you know, what he considers to be good work. Makes sense to so, me. Right. I mean, I, a lot of actors, I mean, I'm, he may or may not be alone in that, but that's his, I, it really comes from his idea of what good acting should look like and feel like, and feel like to him. And, and, and I think that's a big consideration about what it f feels like to the actor versus maybe what it feels like to the audience. And a measure of whether something succeeds or not may or may not coincide with 
whether it feels good, good, to, good to the actor on any given day. That it doesn't mean that you're not being affected or something isn't coming across or you didn't move the audience even though you thought you had a bad night. Mm. Or you didn't, it didn't feel good to you. Well, I've never watched any of my own performances, so I don't know, but I, I guess I, I must imagine is people must think and feel when they're more in it. I'm sure that's yes. an actor. And, and, and sometimes you, and sometimes that's a reliable barometer and sometimes it's actually not. Hmm. I don't know what would be the right barometer. Again, I, I think I, I heard this story of uh, Marlon Brando that later in his career, uh, if he was working with a new director, he'd intentionally ask the director to watch him do a, a scene and he'd do it twice, once for real, like the, the way he thought was a real, and, and once he'd just you know, give it, do it half-assed. And if the director couldn't tell the difference, he'd just walk off the project. Yeah. Uh, because he thought he knew, you know, he could feel it and uh, zoom right. he could tell what, what the effect was. Well, of. you know, that may or may not have been reliable. Certainly he felt it was reliable, but whether something came across or whether a whole bunch of people watched the two different things and, and could discern a difference would be an interesting experiment. Uh, let me ask you a different Question, maybe this, I don't know if this will go anywhere. Is, is acting a skill for real life? Does it help people outside oh. of the... Uh, uh... I, th I think it does. Um, I think it can, first of all, um, the, I have said, and I think it's true. Oh, you've said something and you think it's true. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> I'm willing to stand by it that one of the best ways to get an education would be to study acting and work on plays. Mm -hmm. One, because every time you work on a play, you're entering into a, another world, which involves a study of a time and place and some history and politics and psychology and sociology, and you're learning about human beings and you're being asked to understand the motivations and the wants and needs and circumstances of people outside yourself which seems to be a good practice okay but you're getting that's the part of i thought that's that's the part of it that uh i mean i suppose you could get from a, an english major yes you could you could well, but there's I, something I, there's something about having to really enter into another world that i think is takes it a little further down the road as opposed to a mere uh, brain experience to potentially it's a body experience, but okay, I'll, I'll grant you that. But I thought um, you were going to say some some more. Uh, I had a different idea of, of what this was about. I mean that it's um, that the actual acting training could help you interact with people in, 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 in the even the the socialization of yes that, that training also is what actually education should properly be about. This actually was not what I was thinking at first, but uh, actually I, I think, you know, now that, I, um, that I've done it, I, I think, you know, maybe schools should not just be learning science and, and math and training in the, the cerebral disciplines. It uh, actually also, the school should be much more explicitly about some kind of social development. The, the, yeah, I, I completely agree with your answer is, is a much better one and a much more profound one. And I think my, my answer was a preliminary one and a kind of superficial one. I feel like I had a student after we uh, did a, a, a run through of a rehearsal, which went particularly well, and we were going around the room and each of them were talking about what they got out of it. And she said this thing, she said, what I love about what we do is we make things together that we could never make on our own. And That's good. that I, I, that stuck with me as profound and true and something that our society needs more than ever, that sense of um, an enterprise that can only happen through communal work and that we bring out things in each other we could never do on our own and that um, but that experience too, I imagine uh, you could either 
get well sports sports cool. are about that too and, and or, or and it's, some engineering project that uh, yes certainly together but i feel like there's something essentially um it involves the theater at or or you're making films but it, so much is on the line it's what what you have to invest is body imagination emotion uh taking chances you and also you rely on your partner all these things are true in other enterprises but there's something uh about it that involves the whole being i i, I refrain from using the word soul uh but uh, maybe that's what I mean. Well, that's 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 fair too, because yeah, uh, almost all the other subjects, yeah, it's, it's almost all, all the brain, and you're not you're not training any of I don't know you're, you're uh, in athletics you do the body, but I, I guess not training but, the emotional part of yourself, right? Uh, the part where you even think about or not th interact with that part of your life is not mm -hmm. is totally not there in other in the other disciplines right i mean and, and i think i think you know part of there's a duality in in the west along those lines which actually a, a acting in a theater enterprise involves all the aspects of self you have to have, be thinking and you have to understand structure and you have to have discipline and you have to under, have understanding and yet also at the same time you have to invest emotionally and you have to um you know, you, there's this, you're bringing it, it seems to be potentially a, a whole self, body, mind, spirit, imagination. Um, yeah. Thinking that it's a, it's a full on enterprise and it's communal. And okay, so that, that's all of that is true. I, I think that's good. I actually had another, I mean, look, why did I, in, in part, why did I do it? I, I thought uh, maybe if I, if I could act, I could act like the kind of person who would uh, you know, get girls or convince someone to do. I mean, I'm, a, I'm literally asking now, like, yeah, you have that ability to act. Does it help you in for things that are not actually acting on, on, a, on a stage or the screen? I, I, um, I would say potentially that if it's true that in working on acting you're asked to use yourself body mind soul in ways that you don't normally that you're expanding your range of experience and expression and also exercising some kind of empathy and taking on another point of view that you might actually expand your humanity and also you expand your possibilities of the way you move through the world um, in terms of what you what you recognize, what you see, what you feel, what you say, how you do it. I think theoretically you could. I also sometimes find that actors are at their best and most human while they're acting and sometimes then devolve to their smaller self when they're back in their person. I, I see. Yeah, no, I, I guess I, I know some e examples of that. But here it's like, oh, if only I had the uh, that, the, the charisma of like a Will Smith or something. You know, hey, if, if you're an actor, why can't you be that? Why can't... Uh... Right. You know, I mean, that's something separate about charisma. I'm sure Will Smith has his charisma all the time. But I, it is true. I, I do find that certain actors at school, like they'll play a character who has some qualities and um, discernments and abilities and um, that they have in they have inside themselves but is not developed and in playing that character that they find a part of themselves that they haven't used yet and some of them are able to like oh I found a part of myself I didn't know I had and they're able to keep it and develop it. It's something like a muscle. It's like, oh, I, I was asked to exercise a part of my, my being by playing so-and-so. And some of them consciously then go, I want to keep that person that I 
got to embody and portray, and I found a part of myself. That, that, that can happen. It can. They can play. Is there something uh, that can you play a really smart person if you're not? Smart? <laughs> yes. You know, uh, and can you? Well, it's nice that? to have a writer who makes you say brilliant things. Yeah, but sometimes you know people don't come across. Uh, you know, like <laughs> you could say those those words, and you could look at the face, and it's like, hmm, do I believe yeah. that this person is a? Yeah. Um, Actually, I know some very very smart actors very smart actors who's done their best work playing really stupid people yeah, that seems well, to be quite liberating yes that that's a thing i know uh, people people can do uh but and and i've, I've heard, i guess i've also heard that uh you know a lot of these stand-ups feel like actors do not play stand-up comedians can cannot do that thing if they've, they've seen it in a movie it, it doesn't look it's not the real thing if, if, if it's ever i mean hmm. it's a very specific thing if movies that are about comedians doing that other kind of thing it's not comic acting it's uh, uh it's a totally different they, they well, that's it, it. i'm trying to think what what movies are about that i what was that what's that movie the, with tom the, hanks and the, sally fields oh, right? that, that i was told about and i haven't seen it uh i don't, I don't know remember. that's that's an old that's probably made in the 80s right or something or the early 90s. i don't know what that film was well i have seen other films from the 80s but i haven't seen that one uh but i'm thinking of uh the king of comedy uh, uh-huh my buddy Bob De Niro, play, I mean, it's a great movie and, and he's a great actor. And I guess I can believe that it's a little silly because he's playing a guy who is not supposed to be a real professional. Right, so but I don't think that's a good basis on which to tell because, because what's his name, Rupert Pupkin? Pupkin, is that his character's name? Oh uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it'd be more like, like looking at, um, God, I haven't seen in a long time, Dustin Hoffman playing Lenny Bruce, or I I can't think of that Tom Hanks Sally Fields movie, but that is about the you know stand up comedy and her trying to go make back it. and uh, add corrections and whatnot to this to this video because I couldn't even think of the right uh, title for the Zach Galifianakis thing either. But um, uh, I, yeah, I don't know I don't know what it is. I, I guess uh. Can you become something that you're not? Is is maybe what I'm oh. asking. And oh, to... that's a really good question. I, I guess my working theory is, and whether I whether I actually believe it's totally true, I act as if it might be true, which is has to be good enough. That that we're all bigger than we think and more complex than we think. And we have parts of ourselves that have not yet lived, and that through acting you might get a chance to exercise those parts of yourself. So, one of the great acting teachers at, at Juilliard, Michael Kahn, who's also a great theater director, taught there many years, and he was talking to a student about their acting, and he said, "Look." Think of it this way. You came to Juilliard, if, you know, and if you were a painter and you had a palette and say like, you have red, you are you like your use of red and your ability to use red is great. However, while you're here at school, we want you to practice using blue and green a little bit because you're never going to lose the red, but you need to like get some blue and green in your palette and we're going to ask you to play roles and um, in which you're going to use parts of yourself and parts of your self that maybe you don't normally do because you're so used to leaning on your red. Uh, but we want to give you more colors and maybe in the end you'll basically be your red, but you'll have some blue and green to add to your red, you know, um, you'll, you know, um, and I, I sort of operate on that metaphor that we've all got a lot of colors. These actors have a lot of colors and it's our job to help them find their way to those and then how much they'll use them or where they'll use them or how, whether they'll ever lead with that or that will be their strength is something else, but it will provide complexity and shading to the thing they already do. I guess that could be nice in the, in the training uh, arena, you know. I yes, guess. and now in the world, they're gonna hire you they're going to tend to hire you 
for the thing you do. Yeah, so I, I'm just want to help them to be able to do as many things as possible when they leave, because the industry will tend to put you in a box. I'm thinking of, uh, wasn't it true that like OJ Simpson, when he was first drafted his first year, they tried to make him a pass catching running back and it was a disaster. I, I don't know, but it, they let him do what he's good at. And right. But um, I, okay. I, I see that you try to train people. I guess I still don't know how much it's really possible, whether, how to do it. Let me ask you a different question. Who, how do you, you, you get in, you train them, <laughs> who, who makes it? Who makes it as an actor? Can you t is that a, another thing? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, I think I think I understand your definition of makes it, which is achieve some kind of some level of fame. Uh, That's certainly part of it. Uh, certainly, you could say is able to make his his or her living. Okay, well, that's very different because a lot of them do, and and that people that you've never heard of, and they make a life, and they keep going, and it's hard. And they have moments of success and they'll get something, they'll have some some money and they make a life and they get married and they have a family or whatever. Oh, they, how about you know. this? How about they, they achieve the success that they want? They're not, uh, you know, thinking they, they could have or would have if what they wanted, they didn't get. Uh, who, who gets what they were after in, in this? Uh, I, I will say this, that it's certainly not a question of what, where we started at the beginning of what I would call just pure talent and that there is a level of willingness to work hard at your craft to get better and strengthen your instincts and and work reliable and and reliably and um there's people who have a kind of all the things that make anybody successful in other aspects of life a kind of resilience and ability to move through um, setbacks. There's um, luck. There's having some resources. And that may be at a particular moment. I mean, it may be that your family has some resources so you can get through the tough times or it may be like, um, you know, you just, you had a good place to live and, or you had a job that allowed you to go and do that audition or God, there's so many different factors. Um, yeah, I mean, a I, lot of it, a lot of it revolve around person to me as much or more than your talent, other personal aspects that, that have to do with a kind of, um, resiliency and and um endurance um there's a very famous play the seagull by anton Chekhov about two young actors one of whom keeps going and one of whom doesn't actually commit suicide and and um and the the actor who keeps going says i've i thought it was about fame and all that but i see now it's about faith and endurance um and i wouldn't say it's entirely about that but those are certainly useful things. Faith, your self endurance. I, I, faith, endurance, persistence, resilience, the, you know, the, the opportunity, the right thing, luck. Sure, sure, sure. No, I, okay, we, we've gotten that out of the way, but is there, I mean, anything else? Because of course, uh, unfortunately, everyone is subject to the whims of luck. Then these, these people, they all think that they have talent. They all, uh, you know, if you tell them you had got to be persistent, they'll be persistent if they want it uh, enough, right? But well, not everybody will, and not I, I would say some of the most talented people who come through the school do not continue, and they just they drop out or after a year or two. And I I've learned a long time ago not to clock. You know, put, I wouldn't put my money down on like coming in a first class and saying, "Oh, this person is going to be." They're the one, you know, as I look at a class, oh, that's the most talented person. And I look at some of the people that, that you, whose names you would know, who have come through the school during my years there. And, and in not every case, and in fact, in some of the few kids, 
they're not the person that I would have identified as the quote unquote most talented person in the class. I don't even know if it, it so I'm sure what we're calling talent is, is plays a large role here. I, I, I'm just wondering if there's anything else, anything we can identify. I mean, I know, you know, you, uh, you like this Julianne Moore who uh, I am not as, I don't know, seen her in a lot of movies, but it, it doesn't, she doesn't, Draw me in or something, but but she, what what did she have that the other person? That... Well, I don't know. I don't mean I'm, I'm, yes, that's something else you're talking about. I don't I mean why did she succeed? I'm sure there's plenty of other really good actors who have as much as she had or different that we'll never heard of and never saw and didn't continue. And that's a different question. You're asking me, like, all I can talk about is the people that I've seen and come through, and I go, well, okay, there's. You know, here's this famous person that you know, and here's that famous person that you know. Um, you know, I can think of there's one of my favorite actors who came through the school, and and um, she just stopped after a few years. She got married. She decided to get married and have kids, and and that was that. And she was one of the best actors that I remember going through the school. I will remember her performances there at that school as much or more as anybody that we've been through that you've ever heard of. Um, and that was a life decision about what she was willing to do or not do or live with, you know, the uncertainty and, or maybe she had a certain moment, if she had had $5,000 or a better place to live, she would have stuck it out six more months. I, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I guess I, well, I, I guess the person who gives it up for the, you could say they can lament that they weren't on the, stage and screen or something but I, I guess I'm I'm worried about the person who does does everything that they're, they're supposed to do and struggles yeah and and is there anything that I mean anything beyond that that it's luck or is, I mean what does a how does a person make it is my only question I don't know that there is a good answer I just uh, um, yeah I, I don't know I I Here's, here's my little mantra that I used to say to myself to think about acting as a, as a thing, which is acting is by turns and simultaneously somehow, uh, and can be, not, not all of these things all the time, but by turns and depending on who you are, a true vocation, that is to say, um a calling almost a spiritual thing for some people it's certainly an art it's a craft it's a prof uh, a political act for some people or can be it's a profession and it's a business it is all those things and in order to quote unquote succeed you have to decide you know, what's important to you. For some people, it is a true vocation and they have a successful life pursuing it as a vocation and you never heard of them. They're doing it in some nowhere place for themselves or, you know what I mean? Because it's their true calling to spiritual practice. Um, Wouldn't be enough for me, but... Okay. Right, okay. I and mean, for other people, it's a bunch of different things, but they also have a sense of, oh, it's a profession and a business and I'm built for that, and I'm down for that, and I can negotiate that, and I'm up for swimming in those sharky waters and whatever compromises I have to make, or that doesn't bother me, and that doesn't scare me that it's a business. <clears throat> and understanding all those things and juggling them, um, you know, I think, I think about, I think the, I think of, I think about Shakespeare or Moliere, who were like good business people. You know, what I mean, they Shakespeare just wasn't writing plays. He ran the theater. He counted the receipts. At a certain point, he left London, and he was like, "I'm buying real estate back in Stratford, and send me the receipts to the theater. I'll mail you my plays." You know, he and Moliere was a businessman too, and he had to deal with the king and you know, all the politics and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So it's, 
it's all these things about what you're willing and able to do to to negotiate the structures of um, whatever the industry is at the time that you're 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 born. When I when I went to drama school, my there were a lot of repertory companies in the country, and there was one at ACT, and that was my dream to like that would have been a happy, successful life for me to live in a town, we live in San Francisco or Minneapolis or Chicago or wherever and be part of a rep company. There's some different towns there. Yeah. And, and act in a play every night and do different things. And it wasn't about fame or fortune. It would have been about getting to do the work. Those things don't exist anymore, by the way. Um, uh, there are local theaters. I don't know. Right. But I mean, really, you know, where you could make a living and make a life and, the actors who were at ACT, they'd been there for 25, 30 years. They had families. They taught. They put together things. They would do the occasional TV show or a movie to really supplement their income, but they were on salary to be in plays. Those things still exist in Europe, by the way. They don't exist in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there were a ready answer or a formula for that, um, I guess I'd, I'd write a book and I'd I'd sell it. I'd bottle it. I, I just. Do you have a sense of how? Uh, yeah, I don't. I didn't know that there was going to be any good answer here. But do you have? Do you keep numbers? Like, what's the percentage of? Oh, you know, I I wish we did, and I, I think we should. I, I um. About how many folks are still, doing acting? I guess that raises the other question that the school. We just had the drama division at Juilliard just had its 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. So now, so it was formed in 1968, 69 was the first year. We just, it's pretty young. The music school is over 100 years old and the dance school was started in, is like 65 years, 70 years old. Uh, the drama division is only 50. And a lot of people came back I, for a celebration I'm sure it's less than 50%, maybe way less than 50% of people that are still acting. There's more people who are involved in in the in the performing arts one way or another. But over 50% are involved in the performing arts. No, I don't know. I've no no, I don't know that. I, I I really don't know. I was but I think a high percentage are one way or another, but there's but I it may not even be 50% in terms of what other people are doing and how they're leading their lives. Um, and whether they would still consider happy that they went to the school or what the school offered them. I think a large percentage of them would say, regardless of whether they're acting or not, that that was good and useful and formative and important to them. That sort of goes maybe not in the way you were asking about whether training as an actor is useful for your life. I, I think a fair percentage of them would say that was a good education. That's very, and, and very the challenge and the discipline and the and the work and the camaraderie and the and how hard it was and um, that that and how they grew and changed and found out who they were that that seems useful to them, but I I honestly I, I think it would be uh, incumbent on the school to do a little research in that regard, you know, um, you know they make universities now sort of publish that kind of stuff to see if your education is finance quote unquote worth it however you measure yeah. that I yeah i don't know if i got all those things spending my time you know i got some things doing a lot of math and physics i also expected to be a professional mathematician and uh right that i have my own I, I never wanted to have the the struggles of an actor as i that i'd heard of and not that i'd ever even want to be an actor in the first place and yet i found the struggles anyway uh my own yeah. thing but uh i get okay that's uh that's a lot of sense do you i mean uh, just as one thing do you when you look at who's a good actor who's really good uh, out there can you do you know also uh how they were trained can you can you is, is there oh. any correlation uh there the good ones were trained this way or they didn't go to school or whatever just, just a curiosity because uh, um I think my teacher is, is 
said uh, all the best ones are Meisner actors. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't find that to be true. I I do feel like um I couldn't no, I, I, I can't discern that. I, I can do I I do watch and I think I can see where someone of it's like um well it's hard to tell because in in movies and TV, so much is in control of the director and the editor, and they can make up for certain things. Do you know what I mean? But on the stage, I can certainly tell when someone is trained or, or, or not. Or, or give the or give the the, the, the take that, that was garbage. That's right, which captured, right. All you have to do is once it's in the can, I think it's way I easier George for me Lucas, to- George Lucas, by the way, for that, that poor kid, Jake Lloyd, who played the boy Anakin Skywalker. You don't blame the kid, blame the, the director for that. Okay, keep going. Okay. You know, I, I think it's easier for me to discern um, on stage whether somebody is trained or has, you know. So, for instance, we mentioned Julianne Moore, who I love on film, and I saw her do a play on Broadway. It's, I don't know how many years ago it is now, five, six, seven years. And I don't know how long it had been since she'd been on the stage or if she'd been on the stage, you know. But she literally didn't have the chops. And I find her, I find her luminous in the movies. And the camera gets right in there, and you, I feel like I can see her thoughts. If you've ever seen Vanya on Forty Second Street, that um, she's wonderful in that. Um, um, but in any case, she couldn't. At least the performance that I saw, which is all I can say, is I felt like she couldn't fill the theater in her body in her energy in her voice in her being in a way that she fills a movie screen and that's craft and that's um and that is a, a certain level of training and practice and that i i think i'm able to tell more of that on stage than i am in movies but do you know i, I we're spending a lot of time on her but 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 uh how how was what was her training? Do you know? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you have to look up and see. You know, yeah, where she, some where she went to school, if she went to like the actor's studio or she, I don't know, or, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what she did. Um, hmm. I'm going to have to call it. Uh, that's, that's fine because uh, I'm out of uh, stuff. To, oh, okay. One, one last thing. It occurred to me. Okay. I mean, do you prepare, because you're just talking about the, the uh, on the theater versus the screen, when you're preparing your students, I mean, the money is in, on the screen, right? What do you mean? That's the business. Are yes. You, uh, it, it, is it somehow uh, uh, anachronistic to, to, to focus on the on the stage? What is- Oh, well, that's a good question. And I, and I will say to you that over the years that, that Juilliard and all the drama schools that I know of, have changed and adjusted and giving much more time to giving the students experience on camera work before they graduate, which was not true when I first came to Juilliard 33 years ago. And there was even sort of a sense of looking down your nose at people who went to LA, that we were training for the theater. That is no longer the case. And there's a sense of, um, um, that good acting is good acting, that it's about living in the moment, talking and listening, responding spontaneously, and each of the different media call upon um, different craft and skill set with um, and 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 ways to do that. But there's an essential core thing about belief and living in imaginary circumstance and talking and listening and not knowing and living spontaneously that whether you're on stage or you're on screen, that that is what is the value. And but so we practice all of those things, and hopefully you're becoming an actor who can move back and forth between the different media and be fulfill the requirements of that particular media and also always be seeking the truth and living moment to moment. I would say that that's what we're trying to do. That's very good. But what all the schools are based uh, training schools of thought of, on acting and training are based in the theater, right? It's not like you 
put a camera. Yeah, I, and, I, and I think I think there's a sense of the development of the full instrument body, voice, spirit, imagination, and the the scope that you need to do something like Shakespeare will always be good for you and create all kinds of possibility and you can then move into anything. That's the theory. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for- Well, that was interesting for me. Hopefully, we, well, I have to watch it, but see if we've said anything smart. Uh, <laughs> maybe you, maybe uh, accidentally we stumbled on something. Okay, great. It's a pleasure, Dan. All right, see you later. Bye.